Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. We're going to continue in our study through the book of Acts. It's been a it's been and continues to be an exciting adventure of learning and growing in grace. And today will be no exception because we're looking at, as you saw the title, Jesus is Enough. And I love this topic because too many people try to make Christianity Jesus plus something else. But I tell you what, folks, if you've been going, going to Calvary Chapel Eagle at any length of time, you already know that it's all about you are brainwashed and trained right. Okay, there you go. It's all about Jesus. A little review of where we're at as we've been going through the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas have just finished, uh, they've just returned from this incredible mission trip that lasted about a year. Now, I've never gone on a year-long mission trip, but I, I'm sure that that would be uh, exceptional. And on this trip, there were some trials. If you look back at verse 14 and verse 19, Chapter 14, verse 19, it says, The Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitude, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. That's not my idea of a mission trip, okay? But that's, the, some, that's his, sometimes how bad it gets. And then we also saw some good times. Look at verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And so they made many disciples. So there was great fruit but at a great price. Isn't that how most valuable things in life are? That if you want something good, it usually costs, there's a price to it. That's how everything is in life, I believe. And so on this trip, there's a record number of Gentiles being saved, and that's what starts, what starts tipping the boat a little bit. Because originally, Christianity was mainly the Jews getting saved, and now the gospel message is crossing denominational borders. And non-Jews are getting saved. If you don't know, a Gentile is a non-Jew. The non-Jews, the Gentiles are being saved. And it even says in Acts 14, 27, it says, when they returned to Antioch from where they were, uh, or to Antioch, from where they were sent, they stayed a long time ministering to these disciples. And verse 27 says, uh, when they'd come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that they had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. This is good, but this also caused some problems with our Jewish brethren, because the Jews were really into the law and the law of Moses and all that it contained, and we're going to deal with today, or at least break into the topic, of how do they handle church problems in the early church? How do they handle disputes and, and, and differences? But one thing I, I like to point out before we get into chapter 15, verse 28 of verse 14, uh, verse 28 of chapter 14 says, they stayed there a long time with the disciples. I think mission trips are important, but I also think it's important to stay a long time with those who God's called you to minister to. And uh, I've, I've seen pastors who um, grow a big church and they get popular and in demand and pretty soon they're speaking engagements. They're, they're being called out everywhere to speak. And I just, I've seen dangers where those pastors, they're gone a lot. And, and I, I'm trying the best I can, not that we're a big mega church or, or I'm famous or in demand, but, but uh, even little vacations or little trips, I try to plan them so I'm here, back here on Sunday. I think it's important to invest a long time into your people and to be there for them. And that's my commitment to you as a pastor. And another way we're doing that and taking care of those needs is the small groups. As you meet in small groups, there will be a small group leader and a group of brethren that surround you. And so I want to make sure you're taken care of and that there's long time ministry. And it's not just a flash in the pan, okay? All right. So as I told you before, whenever the gospel's preached, there's good news, bad news, there's fruit, but there's also opposition. And sometimes opposition comes from without, like the enemies of the gospel will stone you. Sometimes the gospel, the, the, the gospel is trouble because there's problems that come from within, church splits and problems. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you open up our hearts, open up our ears to hear what you have to say. Show us how it relates to us. And, and Lord, even those areas where we're maybe we're just learning how Christianity works, help us to learn and grow in grace that we would be the people of God that you've called us to be. I pray that each one would leave this place today taking home special personal lessons that you've taught to them. Lord, guide my lips, my words, my mouth, my heart. 
Have your way, Lord, as we give you this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 15 of Acts, verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now I want to show you, I'm going to put a, a PowerPoint up of the map of where, how far this is, because remember, Jerusalem, I found a simple map, so you won't get confused with other city names. There's a 300-mile journey from Antioch to Jerusalem. And so there were people from Jerusalem who came, went north to Antioch to preach their legalistic, confining, bondage message that you're not really saved. I know Paul came through here and preached the gospel to you, and you even put your faith in Christ, but you're not really saved unless first you become a Jew, get circumcised, follow the law of Moses. And it caused all kinds of problems. They went 300 miles to do that. Now, something you might have caught here is this says they, they came down from Jerusalem. And you look at the map, and they're going up north, right? Just some, a little insight, handy as you read the Bible. <clears throat> Whenever anybody goes to Jerusalem, the Bible will always say they went up to Jerusalem. Whenever anybody comes from Jerusalem, they always say they came down from Jerusalem for two reasons. One, Jerusalem is up on a hill, and it's, it's high elevation, and so that you come down from Jerusalem. But also it's kind of an exaltation thing. Like Jerusalem is that high and holy place. So they came down. And if we're going to Jerusalem, we're going up to, to Jerusalem. That was just kind of the mentality of the Jews. And that's why you find it worded like this as you read the scripture. And so here are these, these legalistic Jews. They, they come down from Jerusalem. And actually they come looking down on the, those who just got saved. And this is an attempt to insert legalism into the gospel. And, and, and again, like I told you, it's Jesus plus something else equals salvation. That's legalism. Jesus plus my works is salvation. Jesus plus my church attendance. Jesus plus becoming a member of this church over here. Or, or Jesus plus all of these other special revelations that our church offers you that other churches don't offer. It's all a ploy of legalism. Watch out for it. Be alert for it. Because it's Jesus plus nothing that saves you. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And so that's why I'm calling this message today, Jesus is enough. Now, if you're taking notes here in, in the uh, fill in the blank, I'm going to tell you a little difference between legalism and liberalism. Because legalism is what we're dealing with today. Liberalism, you'll find down the line somewhere else. But legalism will always attempt to add commandments and requirements to the gospel. Pick your word. It's commandments, requirements. You pick or you put them both. Because legalism will put a burden on you. You're not saved unless you do this. And they're adding commands, adding requirements. Now, liberalism is an attempt to remove all commands. A liberal will say, ah, you don't have to. That was written back then, but you don't have to do that now. And you don't have, you can do whatever you want. Liberalism just takes away all the, the boundaries. You see what I mean? So hopefully that's understandable. Now, here the Jews are trying to say that before a Gentile can be saved, he has to become a Jew. Basically, that's what it comes down to. And this is a real serious matter because they weren't just saying, hey, if you really want to be on the in crowd, become a Jew. They weren't just saying, if you want to be closer to God, uh, follow the law of Moses, or if you really want to experience God's best for you, get circumcised. They're saying, you ain't saved unless you're circumcised and, and become a Jew and follow the law of, of Moses. They're real serious. And keep in mind how this must have hit Paul. Because Paul, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew of the Jews, you know. He was one of the top Jews of the top leading council of the Sanhedrin. He's going out preaching the gospel now as a born-again Jewish Christian, and they're pretty much saying that that was all a waste of time. You, you made false converts, Paul. These, all these Gentiles who you say are now Christians, you just created a cult, or you just created false converts that aren't really saved because they didn't get circumcised and they didn't, they didn't uh, become Jews and follow the law of Moses. And so this was both insulting and offensive to Paul, but it also was not true, okay? So let me give you another by the way here, and you're filling the blanks here, that here's the strategy of most legalists and cults. And I have seen this in most of the cults that I see, that the cults target the saved. 
The cults don't go out into the world and try to find, well, let's find somebody who doesn't know God and bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. A cult will, I mean, I've known cults back in California that they're outside the church building waiting for people to come out to hand them their literature. It's really weird. Could start some fights that way too. Really weird stuff happens. But th that's, that's one of the characteristics, characteristics I've noticed of a cult is they're not looking to save the lost. They're looking to lose the saved. <laughs> so so they're, they're targeting the saved in an attempt to drag the saved into legalism and bondage. Lord, help my speech impediment today. And, and, and so um, this is what Paul is dealing with. And that's what he dealt with w if we get, ever get to the book of Galatians or just read it on your own. That's what he was dealing with when he wrote to the Galatians because the Galatians were being taken over by legalism and Jews who were trying to tell them they had to become Jews before they could become Christians. Let me give you an excerpt from Galatians chapter 6. Excuse me, chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel, Paul says, that you are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. You know, that's what a cult does. It perverts the gospel of Christ. And then Paul says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached, let them be accursed. You know, some of the cults even will tell you, I got this message from an angel. Huh? What did Paul say? Hey, if we or an angel come to you and preach anything other than what you've already heard from us, they're going to go to hell. You know, be accursed. That's not a good thing, by the way. As we have said before, so I say now, again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let them be accursed. You know, it's pretty serious. Because when people rise up and say, oh, oh, do you go to church? But you don't, you, 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 you worship on Sundays? Oh, no, the true gospels you worship on Saturdays. Or whatever. You, you could, I could go on and on listing the variations of people who will come to you and say, you're not really saved. And they'll target the saved people trying to get them confused and put them under a burden. I want to protect you from that. That's my job as a pastor, to teach you the Word of God so that you know the abounding grace of God, how, how deep, how wide, how, how tall. God's grace is much bigger than we ever assume. It's not all up to you to save yourself or follow somebody else's rules. Jesus is enough. Okay, so another important thing to keep in mind here, uh, it, to, when somebody comes to you and says, you've got to follow the law of Moses. You can't be a Christian. You're not saved unless you get circumcised. Follow the law of Moses. Well, first of all, the law of Moses, there are like over 300 laws, and many of them are dietary laws, and some churches today actually try to do that. But here's an insight I was reminded as I was studying for this, and this is one of your fill-in-the-blanks, that the law of Moses never promised to save anyone. I thought, wow, the law of Moses didn't promise salvation. The law, the law promised safety and blessings in the promised land. Did you know that? If you look at all of the promises of the law of Moses, it's so that they will be blessed in the land of promise. The law of Moses did not teach about eternal life and being saved from your sins and, and living it forever with God. Let me give you a sample from Deuteronomy chapter 30 of the promise of the law. What does the law offer? Deuteronomy 30 verse 9, The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. What is it? Right here, right now in the promised land. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he has rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book of the law. So the book of the law specifically was to the Jews to bless them in the land. Don't get caught up in legalism. Don't get caught up in the law of Moses. We are free now. We are under the gospel now. Is there any commandments and do's and don'ts? There are. We'll talk about that as we go. But don't get hung up in the law of Moses. You're going backwards, okay? And so it goes, this book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And so this was God's message to the Jews in order that they may be blessed in the land of promise. So the law of Moses directly tied to the blessings or curses in the promised land. Here's another fill-in-the-blank for you if you're following with the notes that only the gospel of Jesus Christ saves. 
Salvation is through Christ alone. Not through Moses, not through the law of Moses. Uh, only the gospel says stuff like, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The law of Moses didn't promise everlasting life. It promised blessings in the land. I think that's important to distinguish. Now, as we speed through this text, let's look at verse 2, okay? Verse 2, therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. By the way, no small dispute means one big argument, okay? You know, if somebody says, that's not a small dog, that means it's a big dog, okay? And so no small dispute means this was a big knockdown, drag out fight. This was an, a, a, a tough argument here. And, and you think about this, that the Apostle Paul, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, like I told you. He was formerly a ruler on the Sanhedrin, the top 70 of the Jews. And if anybody was going to insist on the law of Moses, you would expect he would. But he was gloriously saved, and, and he, he it was introduced to the gospel of grace. And um, he knew the truth, and so he held his ground. He didn't give in to his pharisaical friends. And, and so, but how do you settle this? Paul still couldn't even win the argument. One of the Sanhedrin, he couldn't, have, he couldn't win the argument. What do you do? Well, you get a consensus of the remaining apostles, which uh, there were a few left at this time. And that's what they did. Verse 3, it says, And being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, and they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and look, there's the apostles and elders had raised up by then, and they reported all things that God had done with them. Now, before we get into how they discussed and disputed and settled this argument, I want to point out something glorious in verse 3, the last part of verse 3. It says, uh, and, and this is one of your fill-in-the-blanks here, is they cause great joy to all the brethren. You know, that's what the true gospel does. When you hear about Jesus, and it's the right Jesus, and it's the right message, and it's the right gospel, it kind of makes you happy. The gospel is good news. Now, cults make you heavy. They don't make you happy. They make you heavy. It's like, oh, I got to do that to be saved? And I got to have perfect attendance, and I got to go to your class, and I've got to read all these extra books, and I've got to obey their, your prophet, and I got to, I'm so happy. <laughs> really, that's what a cult does. It puts extra burdens on you. But, but the true gospel brings great joy to the brethren. And so... Uh, that's what the truth of the gospel produces. I, I think if you want to look at a church and find out if they're really connected to Jesus, look at the looks on their faces, you know? That, there's, a, there's an old saying that if you're happy, you let your face know it, you know? I, I think really, you go to most churches and if everyone's like, they need Jesus, huh? So, as opposed to legalism, the gospel brings joy. I wanted to make sure you, you didn't miss that. Now let's look at verse 5. It says, But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now let me give a little background on this because some of you aren't aware what the Pharisees are. And I have a little cute little saying to help remember that. Because the Pharisees, now these are Pharisees who believed. So I guess they're they become part of the church. They believed in Jesus. But a Pharisee was a sect of the Jews who believed in angels and they believed in the resurrection uh, as opposed to the Sadducees. That was the, another sect of the Jews who did not believe in angels or spirits or resurrection of the body. Now, here's how I remember it, and, you, and this will stick with you. The Sadducees did not believe in spirits or angels or a resurrection of the dead, and that's why they were so sad, you see. Huh? Now, the Pharisees, they believed all that, but they also believed that, that, that the law of Moses was supreme. They studied the law, and they sought to obey the law, and that's just not fair, you see. Okay, that'll help you a little bit, hopefully. At least three of you will remember that one, okay? So, uh, the reason it would be impossible for a Sadducee to get saved is, and remain a Sadducee 
was because the Sadducees refused to believe in a resurrection of the body. So if you're going to get saved and you're a Sadducee, you need to stop being a Sadducee. You see? Okay. All right. So the Pharisees were experts in the law. They held to it scrupulously. And if anyone would insist uh, on Christians obeying the law, it would be a Pharisee. So that's why the problem was. Now, let me read you an ec excerpt from David Gusick on this. He says, Paul himself was a former Pharisee, Philippians 3, 5, who became a Christian. But he came to know that Jesus didn't help him to do what Pharisees did, only better. He knew that Jesus was his salvation, not the way to salvation. Jesus is our salvation. I like that. So, matter of fact, Paul put it this way in, Galat in Gal Colossians. Put your Colossians on. <laughs> in, in Galatians chapter 2. <laughs> Slow down. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by the works of the law. For, listen to this, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's heavy duty. That should settle it right there, right? Now, because of the strong stand in grace, uh, some believe that these Pharisees were false brethren. Because in Galatians, Paul refers to some of these as false brethren. Others think that they were merely legalistic Christians who hadn't fully understood grace. Now, that's possible. Some people get saved, but they still got some things to learn, right? How many of you are still in process? I'm, I'm still in process, right? So you got to give some people grace. There's times where people, they're, they're saved, but there's still some things they got to realize that you really, it's okay to do this now, or it's not okay to do that. And, and they still do some things that the Lord's, I remember when I used to do prison ministry. Sometimes I'd go into prison, and there'd be a guy who got saved, and he'd tell you how, how much he loves the Lord. And you'd go, man, the Bible's effing great, man. And I'm going, God, give him some grace, Lord. You know, Cause Right away, I just want to go, oh! Ah! But I'm not kidding. I mean, some of these guys are hardcore. And you just got to be patient with them, you know, because it's like... I'm sorry I even said that in church. I didn't even say the word, but you now the word's in your head. Lord? Okay. Here's what the NIV Study Bible notes um, says about the phrase, some of the sect of the Pharisees. These people believed in Jesus Christ, but were still identified as Pharisees. Jews who became followers of Christ could still be Pharisees. Uh, the same could not be said of the Sadducees, for they denied there was a resurrection and thus could not believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Here's what the NIV Study Bible, or excuse me, the New King James Study Bible says about the phrase, it's necessary to circumcise them. We've got to deal with this. And by the way, relax, we don't have any PowerPoints for this. This statement summarizes the problem. Is salvation granted through faith alone? Or does a person have to have faith plus works of the law in order to be forgiven by God? And that's always a big question. Okay, I believe in Jesus. What else do I have to do, right? So verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Now you would think nowadays as a Gentile Christian, you would think it's a slam dunk. It's a done deal. What's there to consider? But the church was still forming. They were still trying to figure out some of these things. And there was legalism. There was most of the, the early Christians were Jews who had become Christians. So this was, this was appropriate for them to hammer out. And, and, and also what we see here is this is how the church matters should be settled. I like this. No one supreme leader settles it. It's not like, let's go ask the prophet. You know, you, it, it, the apostles and elders got together and hammered it out. Not like, we got to go see the wizard, you know. You don't, you don't go to some weird one guy who's going to solve it all. It was a, a group decision here. And so the early church had a collective council of apostles and elders. And by the way, in case you're wondering, uh, the Calvary chapels, you know, we've got pastors who are accountable to one another. We hold each other accountable. We keep each other in line. Uh, I meet monthly with a group of Calvary Chapel pastors in the Treasure Valley. It's a wonderful thing. We meet for lunch and discussion. Uh, and we also have regional overseers who are, have been around for a while and kind of, if there's a problem within the pastors, a regional o overseer will come into the picture and help settle disputes. We, we also have a ruling council 
uh, in Southern California because that's where the Calvary Chapels started. And most of the, uh, actually, I don't think they all live there. I think there's some of the original founding members of Calvary Chapels get together and make sure we don't go off course. So I think every church, every denomination should have some kind of council to keep them from, keep them between the lines, you know. Now, fortunately, besides that, most of the, the major doctrinal issues uh, of church have been handled and settled years ago through various church councils throughout the ages, throughout the centuries. All the major doctrinal things have been settled. Uh, most of the existing denominations that have any differences, they're not essential matters. Usually, if you look at different denominations, the difference between us and another Christian denomination, it's not a salvation issue, but it's more like worship styles or minor differences in how they practice, okay? So I'm grateful most of that's been settled. And uh, those who depart from the essential doctrines, that's how we mark the cults. When they, they, they say Jesus was not the son, divine God in the flesh, Son of God, God the Son. When they say that uh, salvation is not through Jesus alone, it's Jesus and our prophet and, or our book, extra books or our extra revelations, that's how you mark out and, and identify a cult. And, and you know what? No one was more qualified than the original 12 apostles to settle matters like this, right? I'm glad they were around back then still to settle this. And, and, I, and I believe that the further we get from the original 12, the less authority we have to, to make any changes. And that's the problem. Every now and then a new church will come around and claim they've got apostles and prophets and they're going to change everything. Well, hey, hold on. It's all been settled in the early church. If, if a new denomination or church rises up and says, we've got a prophet, and he says this, 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 this it's all different. Everything changed. Uh, the further you get from the original, the less you want to mess with anything because you, you get perverted copies, okay? And so, again, today, all essential doctrines are well established and agreed upon among the Christian churches. Those who depart are the cults. Verse 7, we'll move along. Uh, verse 7 says, and when there had been much dispute, stop, much much dispute, they're still arguing over it. I just want you to know this was not an easy uh, thing to settle. Uh, I want you to know that this was, um, this was much dispute. And, and you know what, by the way, when a church has dispute from within, it doesn't mean they're not really the true church. I, I, I mean, I've heard the cults, they're all in one accord. I've heard people from an, a cult would say, how come you have differences in your churches? How come one Calvary pastor says this, but another Calvary pastor disagrees? And usually they're, they're usually minor things. And, let, and I, you know what, I, I, if you've listened to our radio show, there's one guy who calls in, excuse me, he is, he's a Jehovah Witness. We all believe the same. And I just told them, that's because you're not allowed to think. Okay? I mean, sometimes on the air, you get to just say it like it is. It's because you're not allowed to be different. You're, you, you're, you believe what you're told to believe, and you all walk in a straight line. We, as Christians, are allowed to think, and you know what happens when you're allowed to think? You'll have differences of, of opinions. Now, unless it's an essential doctrine, it's okay to have differences of opinion. We need to model unity when that happens, okay? And so there's much dispute here. They're still hammering out. So now we're going to hear Peter's take on it, and I think it's, he's got some good insight. He says, Peter rose up, verse 7, last sentence, second sentence in, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should bear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, accorded, excuse me, who, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, brethren, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is one you need to underline, verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. So Peter's remembering, like remember the first time he went and spoke to Gentiles? He went to Cornelius' house. And as he's sharing the gospel, as soon as he got all the important stuff done, but he, did, he still had a few more points on his notes, the Holy Spirit came down on these Gentiles. They began speaking in tongues, and it's like, whoa, what's going on? Excuse me, order. No, he, he didn't. He let the Holy Spirit have his way. You know what? 
He witnessed the first Gentile Pentecost. They already had a Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came down on the Jews, but now it's a Gentile Pentecost. You know what God was doing? God was saying, stamp of approval. I accept these people just like I accepted the Jews. They are now filled with my Holy Spirit, and they are one with you. Powerful, powerful moment in church history. And so Peter's recounting this time, and he says back in verse 8, that so God who knows the hearts acknowledge them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. There's no difference. God already gave them the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to, what are you going to take it away? All right. Verse 9 also says, he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. This is a decisive matter that God purifies hearts by faith. He didn't say purify their hearts by baptism. He didn't say purify their hearts by circumcision. He didn't say purify their hearts by joining the right church. Purify their hearts by faith. Let, let me read you another excerpt from Gusek about this phrase, purified their hearts by faith. Peter showed how the heart is purified by faith, not by keeping the law. If they were purified by faith, then there was no need to be purified by submitting to ceremonies found in the law of Moses. I like this last statement. Listen to this. Christians are not only saved by faith, they are purified by faith. Clean. Clean because of your trust in Christ. Now I tell you what, the true gospel sets me free. It just, it does give me joy because it takes all the burden of legalism and all those denominations and all the cults. You just can go, man, it's so awesome to be a Christian. So verse 10 goes on to say, therefore, why do you test God? Now this is interesting. I looked at different translations. Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He's saying, hey, we couldn't live under the law. I couldn't do it all. Did you, were you able to obey the law? Me neither. Why do we want to put this on them, right? Now, I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. The New Living says, why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors could bear? I, I looked up the word legalism and a few other secular dictionaries just to see uh, some, what the world would say about this. I love, listen to this. I love what the Wikipedia says. Wikipedia, nobody needs to buy dictionaries anymore. Just go online, right? Listen to the Wikipedia says about legalism. Legalism, the act of putting law above gospel by establishing requirements for salvation beyond repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and reducing the broad, inclusive, and general precepts of the Bible to narrow, rigid, moral codes. It is an overemphasis of discipline, of conduct, and legal ideas. Bravo, Wikipedia. Good job, huh? I mean, it's not always right, but this one was good, okay? So here's for your notes. Now, what legalism does, because you need to understand this. What does legalism do? Now, I use the word from the New Living Translation because I like what they say, that legalism challenges God. Legalism challenges God. It's like saying, oh, yeah, God, Jesus' work on the cross was not enough. It, it, Jesus dying for my sins was not enough. I've still got to do some things. I've got to jump through some hoops yet. I like that. Legalism challenges God. Number two, what, else, what does legalism do? I'm going to give you a choice. You pick which word you want. I'm going to give you two words. Legalism puts an excessive yoke upon believers, or you know what more people understand the word burden, because we don't have yokes anymore except in your eggs. And so, uh, you know, legalism puts an excessive burden on believers. I uh, like, again, this verse. Listen how the message puts it. This is cool. Why are you now trying to out-God God? Isn't that something? Why are you now trying to out-God God, loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too? Isn't that good? That's why it's good to have a few different translations to read. Pretty cool. So the remarkable statement here is now verse 11. This is, this is like the clincher. But we believe that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Now, I want. To, did you catch this? He didn't say they could be saved in the same manner as us. He says we could be saved in the same manner as they. Peter's saying they're saved. And guess what? If you want to get in, you can get in too, just like they did. Isn't that cool? And so he's saying it kind of backwards there. 
but he's clearly implying that they were saved, and he's also plainly pro proclaiming the way of salvation is by grace. Have you memorized that verse yet in Ephesians 2, 8, 9? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift, a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That should be a memory verse for all of us. It's a powerful verse. And, okay, but, and I always like to add this to it. Where do we go from? The, but what about good works? If we're saved by grace through faith, aren't we supposed to be good? Well, the next verse, I, I wish if anybody who memorizes Ephesians 2, 8, 9 should memorize verse 10 as well. It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You're not saved by good works. You're saved for good works, which God has pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So you're not saved by your works, but now that you're saved, oh, does he have a good work for you to do? He's got some good stuff for you. So, and it's, a, it's not a burden. It's a joy to serve the Lord. So make sure you get it right. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, not just 8 and 9. Memorize the whole thing. So I think verse 11 should be the end of the argument. But there's more. It goes on. And matter of fact, again, let me read to you from the New Living Translation, verse 11. It says, We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you could say amen to that? You know, and some people think grace is something God gives you after you do all that you can do. When have you, when could you do, when do you know you've done enough? I mean, that, that's what one of the cults will say. And God, you're saved by grace after all that you could do. What? When are you done doing that now you deserve grace? Grace is undeserved. That's what it is, okay? Anyway, move on. Verse 12 says, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. You know you got an audience when they got to go, ooh, because there's much dispute. They're all arguing. And if you've been in the Middle East at all, look how people talk. It's kind of like Italians. I, I, I mean, it's loud, okay? I went to, I went to Rome once, and, and I thought, I'm watching these people putting their nose in each other's face, talking, and they're talking loud, like they're across the room. I, 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 I'm thinking, <laughs> Paisan. I'm thinking, that's where I get it from. I, I understand now, okay? In the Middle East, they're like that too, and they were yelling. I mean, and all of a sudden, they're silent. That's a good sign. Everyone shut up and listened to Paul and Barnabas, and Paul and Barnabas began to tell the story of what the Lord did already among the Gentiles. Now, did I skip something? I did. Listen, here's another fill in the blank. Beware of any so-called preacher of the gospel who proclaims that you need Christ plus something else in order to be saved. That's how you recognize a cult. That's how you recognize legalism is that Jesus isn't enough. You need Jesus plus my new book for $9.99, you know, or Jesus plus our prophets who've brought new revelation that have been lost through the ages, but we have recovered the lost gospel. The theological answer to that is, shut up. <laughs> Just saying, okay? Okay, uh, let's see, verse 12, they're quiet, they're listening to, to um, Paul and Barnabas, and then James speaks up in verse 13, it says, and after they had become silent, even after Paul and Barnabas finished, James answered, saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Now, a little insight here. James, by now, this is the brother of Jesus, not the James who'd already been uh, martyred, but this is the brother of Jesus who actually rose up and became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And so, after all was said and done, it's time for the pastor to stand up and say, okay, we've heard everybody, now here's the final conclusion. And, and so uh, he, he stands up and he starts giving the final conclusion. And he, he has the last word. Now, I just thought of something. I, I thought of a new bumper sticker. I, I, this, is, this is mine. You can't have it, okay? I thought of a new saying. The piece of wisdom, if I might say so. If you want to have the last word, speak last. Huh? I thought of that myself. So if you want to have the last word, speak last. So James is waiting. He speaks last. And here's what he has to say in verse 13. And he speaks up as men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God uh, at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. 
And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Now, James knew the Old Testament scriptures. He begins to quote Amos. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up. You can't have a pastor speak without quoting scripture, right? Here he goes. And, and the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. He's talking about the Gentiles. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who, who does all these things. Verse 18, known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them. Now here's a confusing thing that I think we might not have time. We might have to cover more of this next week because here's the, here's the instructions they do give the Gentiles. Verse 20, that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. He's saying there's enough people out there preaching Moses. They can, if they want to hear about Moses, they could go to the synagogue. But here's the verse 20 is what is given to the Gentiles. Now, I think this takes, it'll probably take two weeks to make sure you don't get confused into legalism with verse 20, okay? Because there's only, it says four things, but there's only actually three because things strangled and abstained from blood, it's pretty much the same thing because the Gentiles had some practices that in order to get all the blood, they were into blood. They were into eating and drinking blood. And it really is an occultic, satanic kind of thing with the background to it. And they would strangle animals instead of cut their throat and bleed them out because they wanted the blood, okay? And it's... <laughs> Uh, just one, one of my grandsons that's a little bit wild and out there what was he three years old he was like a little kid and he, he cut himself and you know most kids they cut themselves they start bleeding and they're going ah! this kid he's a little different he goes look at my blood look at my blood that's what came to my mind as I read the, the blood okay. sorry all right so something interesting about these requirements is uh, they covered a combination of both moral and cultural issues. And I want you to notice as we get into this, and we'll really finish it up next week, that these requirements were not to follow the law of Moses, but basically there were requirements to reject their pagan practices. Because the pagans were into drinking blood and strangling animals so they get the blood. And, and then a fornication or sexual sin was a part of the pagan religions. And so more than accepting the law of Moses, it was more on rejecting the, the pagan practices that they had. And so let me, let's just get a little bit further into this and then we'll cover the rest uh, next week. Uh, David Gusek says this about abstaining from things polluted by idols and from things strangled and from blood. These three commands had to do with the eating habits of the Gentile Christians. Though they were not bound under the law of Moses, they were bound under the law of love. The law of love told them, don't unnecessarily antagonize your Jewish neighbors both in and out of the church. So here's the thing, and we'll look, and we'll look at the, these other scriptures. I'm going to stop here. Um, but the thing is, the Jews were very offended by eating blood. Now, you and I, maybe if you want, I like my steaks rare. I don't know about you. I like a little blood in there, okay? I just don't want my blood, okay? Uh, so so I, I like a rare steak, and, but to the Jews, because of the law of Moses, it also was, uh, they were supposed to abstain from blood because God said the life of an animal, the life of anything is in the blood. And there, there's a, long, a big background to this. And so <clears throat> they were supposed to, if they go out to eat and the Jews were around, don't stumble them by, you know, oh, look at this rare steak. You know, don't stumble your brethren. And so we'll look at the stumbling factor of this next week. Uh, but also we'll look at the, the one moral law that's given is a sexual sin of fornication or sexual immorality. Now, can I just say that sexual immorality is a very broad term, and it covers anything from, from adultery to sex before marriage sex during marriage with somebody you're not married to, homosexuality, bestiality, pedophilia, pedophilia, yeah, I don't say that too often, thank God, but there's all these different kinds of sexual practices that are, were accepted among the Gentiles, they thought it was just fine, even uh, sex between siblings, it was all, there's a, nothing, 
no, no bars held. Anything can go with the Gentiles. But then when they did become Christians, they realized, okay, some things you need to change. But I also want you to notice, and you're going to talk about this in your small groups, Paul is writing this letter, or the church in Jerusalem is writing this letter to the saved. He's not going to be saying, okay, if you want to get saved, here's what you got to do. He's saying, now that you are saved, you're already saved by grace through faith in Christ. Now that you are saved, let me give you some pointers, okay? Don't stumble your brothers by eating blood, okay? And, and morally, your body belongs to the Lord now. And we'll talk about that in more detail next week. Why sexual sin is wrong. Where it violates the law of God for every generation. Not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles back then, not just the first century Christians. But right now, if you notice, sexual sin is, they're, they're removing all the taboos. Anything goes. And it, it will get people to not look at themselves as holy, created in the image of God. It will get people to think, my body belongs to me, nobody else. I could do with my body what I want to do. But you know what? If you're a Christian, your body belongs to God. If you're born again, you're a child of God, your body belongs to God, and you must be holy unto the Lord. Okay? And so we'll talk more about that because time does not permit. I'm watching the clock, and I know you are all watching the clock.